the evidence is fully and adequately explained by normal models of uh, religion, sociology of religion. We don't need anything miraculous. It's very similar to like Newton explaining the motion of the planets. Like you can also say, but it has to be angels pushing the planets because we don't need the angels. The laws of physics already explain the motion of the planets. And we got the same thing here. We've got standard models of uh, in the sociology of religion for the growth of religions, explains all the data, fits all the data. There's no nothing remarkable about it. So there's there's no need to throw in extra supernatural hypotheses, as much as you might want to, of course. Gotcha. Okay, so so far we've kind of covered the birth of what is Christianity. We've got a time frame, and we've even got an injection of political power there. So let's switch topics just a little bit over to the written side of it, the literature. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you've, you said something about deliberate symbolic irony in, um, in one of your speeches. Yes. What is that? Uh, we well, find this in the Gospel of Mark, for example. Uh, there's a lot of irony. So <clears throat> irony was a serious means of communicating values and ideas in ancient literature. Uh, and Mark does this. So your classic example is uh, Peter or Jesus tells Peter, you have to uh, pick up my cross and carry it. Or you have to pick up your cross and carry it to be my follower. And then, of course, Peter abandons Jesus in the narrative and another uh, another Simon. So this is Simon Peter is the one who abandons him. But another Simon of Cyrene ironically ends up carrying the cross of Jesus, a complete stranger. Mm. And this this is a sort of, you can see this sort of a literary irony. It's the kind of thing you'd see in a, a work of work of fiction to say like, oh, that's 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 a commentary on on who actually can be saved and who's not going to be saved or how you deal with doubt and things like that. It's it's, it's just, there's a lot of these kinds of ironic pushes and pulls. You have uh, uh, when uh, James and John are arguing with each other as to who's going to sit on the right and left of Jesus when he comes into his glory. So you have that scene and Jesus chastises them. And then who's who's on his right and left at his death? It's these common criminals, right? So there's this idea of the least shall be first and, and uh, this the reversal of social order. Um, these are all parts of the message of the gospel. Having the women at the tomb rather than the men. The, be, the women be the first to discover the resurrection of Jesus. That's a reversal of what the expectation would be, the reversal of social order. It's, an, it's a uh, sort of a reification of the gospel itself, that the least shall be first. Uh, the, the most downtrodden, the lower classes, the you know women before men even, um, that all of your arrogant presumption about what the correct order of honor is, is going to be completely overthrown uh, by this uh, by this new movement. And ultimately they're saying by by God, but also they, they were trying to create this sort of utopian Marxist egalitarian society as well. So this is also part of a sort of a social movement, uh, a sort of message for how people should live and organize themselves in communities within communities. But it also had this cosmic dimension that God's going to come and completely overthrow all hierarchies and flip everything upside down. The meek shall inherit the earth, not the powerful. That's, you know, that's the uh, the whole construction of, of this. And so this gets reified in narratives using irony, reversal of expectation, and other literary devices. What is that? So does that narrative suggest that this is all just an artificial declaration of this supernatural God? Or... Here's a better question. Uh, using deliberate symbolic irony, was that an acceptable ancient biographical method of his of recording historical events, or does it simply indicate it's all artificial? I mean, yes, there was a there was a dispute, of course, as to how honest it was. Uh, there were people who said, no, you should just tell straightforward facts and not do this fancy dance stuff. But everybody did the fancy dance stuff anyway. So that this, this construction <laughs> of these mythologies and things. Um, and it, it depends, of course, when you look at the Gospels, especially if you look at Mark. Uh, Mark appears to fit this model of being constructed solely to explain. It's basically an extended parable. Uh, John Dominic Crossan wrote a book called The Power of Parable. And his point is that the Gospels themselves are just extended parables with Jesus as the character in them. They're mm. not even meant really to be taken historically true. They're, they're meant to be models to discuss about moral moral teachings and when the teachings of the gospel and stuff. Um, now later, more and more Christians started taking them literally and started attacking uh, fellow Christians who didn't take them literally. And so you had this battle within the church uh, and it was the the literalists won essentially. That they're the ones who took over and uh, basically defined what we call orthodoxy later that they weren't orthodoxy, but they were the one that, that prevailed. So this, all the church fathers we have are of that sect. We don't get to read the church fathers of competing sects because all of their texts were destroyed or uh, if they're preserved at all, it's only just barely in quotation or in refutation by later Christian authors. So um, 
so that it looks like it begins the same way all religions did, where there's this idea of allegory as, as the way to sort of conceal the message. And Mark has Jesus say this in Mark four, Jesus is preaching in parables and the disciples are confused. Like, what are you talking about? And Jesus takes them away in, in private and says, Oh, look, let's say, to the public. I teach in parables so that they won't understand. And, and they, because they have to become insiders before they, they deserve to understand and be saved. So to you, the insiders, I'm going to tell you the secret meaning. And it's not the literal meaning of the story. Of course, the parables, that's not the literal meaning. It's the underlying meaning and sort of the symbolic meaning of the story is the true meaning. And so Mark is giving us a clue there. He's saying like, this is to the reader. He's basically saying, this is what my gospel is doing for you. Outsiders are meant to take it literally and therefore not understand the real meaning of it. Insiders will be told the real meaning. Now, over time, this insider knowledge, which was oral, uh, oral lore, sworn to secrecy, <clears throat> wouldn't be written down. It was easily lost and transformed. So you started having more and more of these historicist sects just treating it as literally true and denigrating the ones who were claiming it was allegory. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's the sect that ultimately dominated and controlled all the literature and therefore distorted and skewed uh, our access to the origins of Christianity. Is there any kernel of truth in any of that in the oral traditions or histories or any history reported? What's true? For Jesus? Are you talking about? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, that's disputed, of course. Uh, I suspect not. Uh, uh, well, <laughs> some of the things are in there that are real, like um, the interaction of Pontius Pilate and Caiaphas, like those as historical figures, those, you know, Pontius being the prefect of Judea, that was real. So they took real historical events and created, used them as sort of the scenery through which to have Jesus move and interact. Uh, and then they even used the real top three, the, the pillars, uh, Peter, James, and John, the top three guys uh, who, who started the cult, they're allegorized in there as well. So um, so you have these, uh, you have elements of history that's, that are in there. Now, is there any more history in there? I think it's inaccessible if that's the case. And that's one of the big problems I have with, uh, there's a lot of attempts to try and use criteria to extract historical facts from underneath the layers of legend in Jesus, but I, none of them work really. So there could be historical truths in there that we just we just don't have the means to know which things are true or if any of them are. It's just not accessible anymore because we don't have any more eyewitness sources uh, to the life of Jesus. And that's one of the reasons why his life is doubtable as well. Um, but if we had that, we, could, we would have better access not perfect access. It would be more like Socrates where Socrates didn't write anything, but we have several of his disciples, eyewitnesses wrote stuff that's contradictory and largely reflects the disciples beliefs rather than Socrates. So that you have to reconstruct the true Socrates underneath the layers of, of mythology. But there at least we have eyewitnesses. We actually have a variety of different sources from different perspectives. The evidence is good there. Uh, if we had that kind of evidence for Jesus, his existence would not be in doubt. We would just be arguing over what's the true Jesus amongst all these different versions of him that people are talking about. But we don't have that. <clears throat>